So welcome everybody to our September Seed Saver class. Um, I'm excited to talk about uh, starting your own seed library at home or at a school or community garden. So some of our presentations are kind of beginner seed saving classes. They are kind of just covering the basics. Some of our classes are talking about cleaning or planting. Some of our classes dive really deep into um, the, well, dive deep into the basics of genetics. We don't really get too deep, but it's definitely an advanced topic. Genetics, pollination, traffic control. And this talk is actually just about having a seed library and what it sort of means to have one at home, at a school or community garden. One of the things that uh, is important in the Master Gardener program as part of the University of California is that we get research-based information out to the public and um, seed saving is a really interesting topic. If you've attended my other presentations or other presentations on seed saving, this may not be new to you, but uh, even though the University of California has a lot of uh, researchers and they study all sorts of different crops and, um, you know, all the life cycle pest management, best practices for farmers, all of that, then... Um, they um, don't have a lot of comp compilations of seed saver information for the home gardeners. So when I first became interested in seed saving, it seemed like there was this big disconnect between the university, which has lots of information, but why couldn't I go to the university for them for home seed saver information? So I started to look up specific plants. So if you looked up tomatoes, you could find endless amounts of information on seeds, seed um, cultivation and seed starting from the University of California and other universities. And that's where it sort of dawned on me, you know, oftentimes on a, on a food scale, um, seed saving, cultivation and starting are done on a commercial level. You know, 50, 70, 80 years ago, a lot of our food growing was done on a smaller scale and a lot of people supplemented their kitchen, um, you know, their cooking with some things they had grown. Maybe they were just growing herbs. Maybe they had some summer vegetables, some lettuce, a few things, um, especially with foods that are hard to find, you know, fruits and vegetables that are hard to find. People would be growing those things um, as sort of like their specialty garden to add to their cooking. Um, but when you really look at uh, seed libraries and like, okay, we wanna start a seed library, where do we find information? It's really interesting because a lot of the information that you find is provided by seed companies that sell seeds. And one of the most reputable ones, not reputable, but one of the most uh, commonly so sourced and cited um, page is the Seed Savers Exchange in terms of uh, information on home seed saving. And you would kind of think, you know, if you're skeptically minded and you're like, why would these companies that want to sell me seed give me information on saving seeds? It seems sort of counterproductive to the seed um, business, right? If you're telling your consumer, like, look at the recipes for soda or certain hamburgers, it's like a guarded secret. Um, what is the special sauce, right? And they won't tell you. And seed saving companies will tell you exactly how to save seed. And that should be an indication that it's not always an easy activity. But I'm going to break down in this presentation sort of like where you can seed save and sort of look at maybe helping you define if, if you just have in your head, like, I'd love to have a seed library at home. You know, again, 80 years ago, I don't think anybody would have thought twice and probably if you you know your grandparents were of that generation um, 80 years ago then they probably had a stash of seeds somewhere around the house and they didn't call it a seed library it was just something that kind of uh you know many people had if your family didn't have one maybe an aunt or an uncle or a relative a grandparent something but that was pretty common and it wasn't really a thing so if you're thinking about a seed library i'd like to sort of break down what the logistics and realities are of having one at home at a school or community garden. Um, and I forgot to put a slide in here, but this weekend we have a school and community garden collaborative workshop where we're gonna kind of highlight a program. Um, and I'll kind of touch on elements of that program, um, a seed library in every community program that the master gardeners are working on. I'll highlight that throughout the presentation. 
before we go on any further, I'm going to um, just do a little bit of housekeeping and uh, share a little bit about our program. I have a short public service announcement and then we'll get right back to the topic. The presentation is being recorded. Feel free to ask questions as we go along, especially when it comes to seed saving. I really love there to be dialogue. You know, um, I don't know if who is on is a really experienced seed saver and would like to share wisdom, or if you just thought about seed saving when you saw this title on the website and you have no clue. All of these questions, all of these comments, all welcome. I have my camera off just to save bandwidth. I don't have a great connection at home, so just to save bandwidth. And then I keep everybody muted, but feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. If you'd like a PDF of this presentation, um, this presentation will be on our website under recent presentations. And we're also gonna add it to our gardening channel. I'll show you what that button looks like at the end. If you do wanna save anything that's put in the chat, you can do that by clicking the three dots on the upper right-hand side of the chat if you're on a PC or like a laptop. So if you're not familiar with the Master Gardener program, we're part of the University of California under the Agriculture and Natural Resources Division. And Master Gardeners are a trained group of volunteers who love sharing peer-reviewed research with the public on growing food, sustainable landscaping, and better living through gardening. Sounds kind of boring, people who love to share peer-reviewed research, but we like to, you know, get gardeners the correct information based on research, you know, find effective pest management techniques, the best techniques for uh, starting seeds, the best techniques for keeping your trees healthy. We wanna get you good information so that we can help you on your gardening journey. So we're just really enthusiastic plant people. In addition to Master Gardeners, we have a program, the Master Food Preservers and Nutrition Program. 4-H is a program in our county office under the University of California. And we have academic advisors as well. We have a seed library. And right now we are open the second Saturday of each month at Highland Library um, in Highland. And from 11 to, oh, it says 11 to 2 p.m., but it's 11 to 1 p.m. Apologize for that typo. Then we are at the Highland Library. You can find that information on our website and it's the second Saturday of each month. And if you need a reminder about when it is, you can find it on our website calendar. And we're also gonna start one at the Ovit Library. We haven't picked the day of the week but we'll be there once a month as well, where you can come and get free seeds. We also have free seeds at information tables. So if you see us out there in the public, you see our Master Gardener logo, where it is, there it is. Um, then uh, come check us out, check out our booth and we probably have free seeds. The seeds are donated to us um, from organizations and we'll talk about that in just a minute. And some of them are donated from the community. And then we also do these free seed saving classes on a wide variety of topics. As I mentioned in the beginning, some of them are really basic. Some of them are more advanced. The master gardeners are always here to help. We have a helpline and it's an email or a phone number. And you can call us or email us anytime with gardening questions from seed saving to pest management to what's wrong with my tree to what should I plant this week? Um, how should I plant natives? Uh, what's up with my soil, those kind of things. If it's a gardening question, give us a call. Um, we also have an in-person Ask a Master Gardener time that we're going to start in Ontario. And currently, in addition to our seed library pop-up on the second Saturday of each month at Highland, we're also there. You guys can come and ask us gardening questions in person. And then the second Sunday of each month from 11 to 1, we're online and people pop in and they ask us questions about planting. Sometimes we pull up people's addresses and we give them planting advice for where to plant a large tree. People will turn on their cameras and show us their artichoke in the backyard and ask us what's wrong with it. Um, so great opportunity. We're there the second Sunday of each month and you can share your photos, bring your questions. So we're here to help. Really quickly, I have a public service announcement. Really important announcement, I'm a citrus lover and so many people in Southern California have citrus. Um, and then we'll get back to seed saving, which is today's topic. So we wanna protect our citrus. There is a deadly citrus disease. It's caused by a bacteria. It is fatal to citrus, uh, not harmful to people. And the disease right now is very active, especially in the Ontario Colton Fontana area. There's been a lot of cases of this disease in citrus showing up. Again, not harmful to people, but will kill a citrus tree in about 10 years. And the disease is spread by a tiny insect, just like a mosquito spreads West Nile virus or malaria. So we wanna protect our citrus. 
Right now, there is no cure for the disease. There's lots of people working on it, um, but there's not a cure. We want to protect our citrus by controlling the spread of this tiny insect. The same way in a malaria or West Nile virus infested area, you protect people by um, reducing mosquito populations. So here's the steps. Not sharing fruit, any citrus fruit. Don't share any citrus fruit with stems and leaves. The insect can be hiding on the leaves. It's about the size of a half a grain of rice and the larvae is even smaller. So any fruit you share, remove the stems and leaves. You don't wanna share cuttings. This is a terrible citrus disease, but it can take a few years to show up, just like somebody could have COVID and not show symptoms. So we don't wanna share any cuttings. And you wanna keep ants out of your trees. Ants are really um, important to um, uh, let beneficial predators do their job. So if we have uh, beneficial, if we have beneficial predators in our yard, ants will keep those beneficial predators out of our trees. And so if you have more questions about that, I'm happy to answer that at the end of the presentation. And for those of you who just joined, this is just a short public service announcement, and then we'll be talking about seed saving. And then the, th the fourth step is to tell your friends, family, and neighbors, and together we can prevent the spread of citrus screening disease, um, which has been found um, all over Southern California. Again, if you have more questions, happy to answer those at the end of the presentation. And then just a reminder, we don't want to pack any pests, and that ties into seeds. You know, today's topic is seed saving. There was a medfly quarantine in Upland. It has ended. Um, they did the genetics on the medfly and it looks like it came from Hawaii. And seeds are, you know, they have a whole website, don't pack a pest. Um, you know, you're not supposed to bring in cuttings, bring in illegal plant material, bring in soil, or even bring in seeds. And so just a reminder, if you are um, saving seeds, you should be conscious of your sharing of seeds. And I know on the one hand, um, if you look at people for thousands and thousands of years, we've been sharing seeds, um, but we also want to be mindful that like citrus greening disease um, was an introduced bacteria, and then it was spread by an introduced pest, and so we sort of need to balance our urge to um, share seeds with the community um, outside, you know, you know, if we were to go to a foreign country or go to the east coast, and um, we might want to be mindful of the fact that those seeds could potentially have pathogens on them that could impact the soil. Um, and to that note, um, uh, when we do save seeds, this is something I didn't really used to mention quite as much, but when we talk about cleaning seeds and in a seed library, you wanna clean your seeds, it's important to remember we're not trying to sterilize our seeds. We're not shipping them to a foreign country you know, if you purchase seeds in a foreign country or you travel with seeds and they need to be approved by the local regulatory agency, the Ag Commissioner Customs, then those seeds have gone through some sort of sterilization practices to make sure that microbes in the soil um, are not going to harm other regions, right? And there may be a microbe in Southern California that's in our soil that has a check, you know, sort of the checks and balances are in place that maybe the weather um, you know, our soil being very sandy in some areas or our summers being very hot. Maybe that condition keeps the pathogen in check. But if we are sharing seeds, we may be introducing, um, you know, sharing seeds far away, we may be introducing a pathogen that may not have those checks and balances. It may not have a predator. It may not have something else like that. So if we are sharing seeds, important to keep that in mind. Um, but when we clean them, we're mostly just looking at removing the plant material and not actually sterilizing them with the idea that we're keeping the seeds pretty local. So with that, I'm just going to get back to our presentation today. If you have any questions about citrus screening, again, happy to answer those at the end. So let's talk about seed libraries at home. The San Bernardino County Master Gardeners, we started our seed library in 2017. Is that right? Or the end of 2016, um, several of us went to a festival up in Northern California put on by a large seed company. Really fun festival where they talk a lot about seed saving and the importance of it and um, all sorts of different elements of seed saving. And that inspired us to uh, start the seed library. And so we started our seed library. And these are sort of the, I can, I'm sharing with you today 
um, the things that we have gone through after, what, I guess five years, um, the things that we've learned and sort of boil it down to something that you could start at home, start at your local community garden or at your local school. So we'll talk about the goals of a seed library in general. Just a real quick uh, slide on supplies you need because it's pretty basic. But then the considerations and then going back to the goals for your seed library. So you now the goals of a seed library in general, a seed library is um, you know different. You know, some people ask, what is a seed library? And a seed library is different than a seed bank. The uh, California Botanic Gardens, it used to be the Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Gardens, they have a seed bank. And in that seed bank, they collect seeds from their collection. They also go up into wild spaces and collect seeds. And they bank those seeds for their um, sales. You know, they sell native plants at their grow native nursery. They grow plants for their botanic garden. And then they also go out and rewild areas that have been impacted by, um, you know, burn events or, or erosion events or other things that have happened in wild spaces. And they have a true seed bank. Another one um, is uh, Sval oh, is Svalbard. I feel like I'm missing a letter in there. But the one that's up um, in the northernmost parts of the world where it is, um, you know, these seeds are brought from all over the world and, um, you know, different countries will send up a representation of their country's most important seeds. And it's sort of like a doomsday vault of seeds. Those seed uh, banks are climate controlled. And those seeds are sort of put in stasis. You know, they're put on hold. When you look at what we do as humans, as seed savers, is we look at natural processes and we like to intervene and control and change the outcomes, right? So if we see a river and the river might benefit us to be flowing some other direction, we'll make changes to that river. If we see a plant, uh, corn and bananas are great examples of plants that looked very different several hundred years ago. Bananas had very large seeds. Corn had very small seeds, um, and we, over time, over hundreds or thousands of years, have made shifts by naturally selecting for what we wanted. You know, a lot of the produce that we grow now um, would be unrecognizable to people even a few hundred years ago. And similarly, if we were to go to a farmer's market just a hundred years ago, we would see so many varieties varieties of potatoes and onions and tomatoes and peppers and squash that really aren't around anymore. Our diet has gotten very um, sort of narrowed down. You know, we've lost a lot of diversity. So a seed bank is there to sort of, okay, so going back to our control. So what seeds, you know, what we like to do as humans is we like to save them. We like to relocate them. We like to selectively breed them so that we know what we're getting. And so we're stepping in. Nature is making that fruit or making that seed pod, whatever it is. And we're stepping in and we are harvesting that seed and saving it to do something with it. So in a seed bank, they are putting that seed on hold. That seed, again, is in a climate controlled situation, often a, temp a temperature, so temperature control, moisture control, it's a very controlled environment. What we wanna do at home or in a school or community garden is gonna be a seed library, which is scaled down. This is the seed library that we started with in uh, Chino Basin Water Conservation District. It was a bookshelf with shoe boxes. Climate control was whatever the office temperature was. When everybody went home on the weekend, who knows how hot it got, lights were off. Probably not very humid, um, but very little temperature control. So that's a big difference between a seed bank and a seed library. The other idea with the seed library, just like we think of a normal library, is where people can check out and check in seeds. So with the seed library, you know, at home, you know, you're, you're your customer, right? If you have a seed library at home, you check seeds out from yourself and you check them back in and you cultivate this sort of like, you know, you have a reading library, you have your favorite books, you read them when you can, um, you share them with friends. And that's the other thing you do with the seed library, right? Is maybe you're sharing your seeds with friends at a community garden. It is a collection of people 
that may know each other through association of the garden or outside, but it's going to be, you know, um, a little bit more of a, an activity that involves, um, you know, it's not just you at your home with your family. And then at a school, you have another level um, at where you have a teacher or an after school person, someone with a STEAM or STEM program, um, somebody championing this where maybe it's students checking those seeds out, maybe it's other teachers. But the idea with a seed library is to check seeds out and to understand that it's not climate controlled. The thing about um, seed libraries is that this is where it's a really slippery slope for success. So really want to identify the goals of a seed library. Let me get a drink of water here real quick. Pardon me. So you want to think what is the general goal of a seed library is to provide seeds for yourself. You know, and if you think about seed availability, um, I think all of us in the last eight, two years have really had a shifted perspective. I know that I have, have had a shifted, excuse me, perspective about something that's always been available, sort of realizing it doesn't take too many things in a series of events, like a chain of events, to then not have access. So if you remember the spring of 2020, it was actually pretty hard to find a lot of very common seeds because everybody was wanting to garden. We really didn't have a shortage of seeds in the United States, but the supply chain, we all became very familiar with the toilet paper, right, um, became an issue. And so um, being able to have those seeds at home to provide for yourself, um, having seeds that you can, you know, if you're a lead at a community garden or you're a community garden member, to have a set of seeds that your community garden members could share and use, or the same at a school. Um, some people also have a seed library. And so this next bullet point um, about creating plant diversity is I sort of would think like having seeds to give and share, um, to use for your own, you know, have for your own use, to share with the community is um, a pretty easily achievable goal with a seed library. The next level is sort of like having, um, you know, helping to create plant diversity. I apologize, I forgot the numbers. There's this great movie. I'm not endorsing them as a master gardener, um, but if you're interested in seed saving, um, it is definitely a, a movie with a political message. And again, I'm not uh, endorsing them as a master gardener, but Seed the Movie, um, just the basic name, Seed the Movie, is a really wonderful movie that came out four or five years ago and talks a lot about. Um, the diversity that we've lost. So saying, you know, for example, we've gone from having 300 varieties of tomatoes to now only having 100. We've definitely narrowed our diversity. And if you look at the number, if you look at the average person living in America, most of us probably eat, you know, five or 10 different types of vegetables and fruits. And that's kind of it. You know, we have a really, and often, you know, with bananas, it's mostly one kind of banana. You know, with lettuce, it's two or three types of lettuce. You know, we've really lost that diversity. And in that, you know, our food system becomes fragile. You know, there's there's sort of like in permaculture, there's this sort of common knowledge that monoculture, you know, just growing a large field of wheat or just growing a large field of tomatoes is, a, is something that can create problems if a pest comes in or a disease comes in or the weather is unfavorable for that crop, then you lose everything all at once, right? And so, you know, same thing like our diet. We eat a variety, a, a wide variety of things, whether you're vegetarian or not, to have variety in your diet, to give your body a little bit of everything that it needs. And so permaculture is a movement that looks at creating diversity. So you're not having, you know, 500 acres of tomatoes and 500 acres of corn and 500 acres of soybeans or something, that you have diversity. And so in home seed saving, you can grow plants or even in a, on a scale like at a community garden or a school garden. You know, if you're a farmer who is selling tomatoes, then you are going to grow a type that is probably disease resistant that is probably pest resistant, one that's going to work well and have a very good chance of giving you a high yield. A farmer invests their time and their money, their, all their resources into a crop 
they need that return on that crop or they can't produce the crop the next year. A home gardener has a little bit more flexibility usually. And so there's a lot of what they call heirloom varieties that you can seed save and grow at home. They may be varieties that are not as common. Believe it or not, plants fall out of fashion, just like, uh, you know, bell bottoms or whatever here, you know, they come back. Now I saw my kid, my, my daughter wearing mom jeans and that's all the fashion. And I'm just like, as a kid of the eighties and nineties, like, looking for mom jeans intentionally is like, are you joking? <laughs> that was, you know, and that's now totally popular and plants fall in and out of fashion. I want to find a green gauge plum. And the bottom line when I looked and looked and looked was that the plum that we used to have is now unfashionable. And because of this and that, people just don't grow it. And if people don't grow it, I now don't have access to it. So varieties of tomatoes, varieties of produce that, you know, have been around for a long time. There is definitely a group of people in the United States and the world who are looking for those varieties that are unusual and trying to grow them out so we don't lose them. The thing about that is definitely something that any of us can do, but it definitely requires a little bit more of a skill set to preserve a lineage. It's definitely something you can do, just have to have a little bit more experience. So that may not be the goal of your seed library, or maybe that's a future goal of a seed library. And then the next sort of goal is to make small steps towards seed sovereignty. You know, if you look at, um, just like many companies in the United States, it is a relatively small handful of companies that on a large scale grow most of our seed. And even if you look at the small companies, the quote unquote small companies that grow seed, that's actually a relatively small group of uh, people as well. And if you go back a hundred years, each valley, each community would have seeds. And you know we don't wanna sort of look through the apocalyptic lens, but it's always good to be prepared and having a seed library at your community garden gives you a little bit more independence, right? Having a seed supply at home gives you a little bit more independence. Having a seed library at your school, a little bit more independence. And so think about the goals. And I like to look at these three goals as maybe building on each other as the seed savers get more experienced. I don't know if you guys have anything else um, about a goal of a seed library that you'd like to add. Um, or, you know, or you can type it in the chat or you can, um, you know, just shout it out. Um, and uh, otherwise, let's dive into some things you should not expect at first from your locally grown seeds. It's important to have realistic expectations. Now you may have, and, and this is a good thing to think about if you're at a school or community garden. Um, in a lot of the networking that I do, I'll find partners throughout San Bernardino County that are working on very similar activities that I and my programs are. And I'm like, wow, we're doing almost the same things. We should connect. So if you are considering starting a seed library outside of your home in a school or community garden, you might want to just sort of ask people what kind of seed saving experience they have. Um, you would be surprised. I'm always surprised at people who are like, oh, I've been seed saving broccoli for 25 years. That's a really hard thing to do. And they're doing it. And I'm like, oh, good to know. And even within your family, if you have a little bit of an extended family, maybe do a little bit of polling and see if you're doing a seed library at home for yourself and your family. See if anybody's got any wisdom. Um, and so, uh, yeah, great question. There was a question in the chat about heirloom plants and I'll get to that um, in just a moment. Um, great question. And so one of the things um, that makes, this is sort of where the dream of seed sovereign, sovereignty, saving uh, uh, plants that may have fallen out of favor or are becoming less available sort of where the rubber meets the road here, which is that getting plants to breed true can be more or less difficult depending on the type of plant. So you can seed save from almost anything. As long as that plant gets pollinated, you can harvest and save that seed. The question is, when you plant it, is it going to give you what you want? And we'll talk more about that in just a second. The other thing is if you're planning to seed save and you're sort of thinking along these tiers 
of uh, you know seed sovereignty, independence of your community, um, food security in your community. It's important to understand that initially um, that you may not get much crop production because it's really also something you need to consider when you're considering varieties of plants to seed save from. Um, your garden may have seasoned seed growers, in which case um, definitely tap into that knowledge. The master gardeners, part of this seed library in every community project that we want to get started is for us to be some of those seasoned seed growers who can sort of help you, you know, with our experiences and our failures sort of move through to success more quickly. Um, it's important to think about if you're in a community garden or even a school garden setting where you don't have control over what's happening at other plots or other school garden plots, um, do you have a group of people that wants to work together towards seed saving goals? Certain seed saving requires more of a cooperative effort than others because plants can crossbreed. And so also you can start with easy seeds, tomatoes, lettuce, a lot of your herbs, really great places to start for easy seed saving and to get some pretty good successes. Types so you can kind of break it down into types of seeds. You've got your native plants, flowers, fruit trees, fruits and veggies. You know, everything makes a seed, even succulents make a seed. For your native plants, native plants can be really easy to seed save from and very difficult to seed start from. So I noticed when we first started our seed library, we would get people bringing in tons and tons of you know seeds that were very difficult to start. Um, and if you want to get more into that, um, I'm happy to email you a resource sheet if you reach out to me and I can just all drop my email in the chat. Um, you know, our, all of our master gardeners can help, but some of them have a little bit more um, resource knowledge when it comes to seed saving. So you're welcome to email me about native seeds and what I will provide you with is a like 85 page document where they document the Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Gardens, California Botanical Gardens document their struggles with seed starting. So you could seed save native plants all day. They're not all easy to start. Buckwheat is a relatively easy one to start. There is a native sunflower like a helianthus. Um, some of those are easier to start and other than others. But really, um, you know, like I've seen like a meme on social media that says, oh, I've decided that buying plants is not the same activity as, you know, being a good gardener or planting your plants. And harvesting seeds is not the same activity. Being good at harvesting seeds is not the same activity as being good at starting seeds or having seeds that will give you what you want. So native plants... I would put consider for the most part, that's a little bit more of an advanced area and the skills you're looking for with that are someone who's knowledgeable about starting those seeds. Some of them need exposure to acid. Some of them need exposure to flames, smoke. Um, some of them need um, a period of cold, of chilling to, to sort of um, replicate snow. So um, that's the skill set as someone who's good at starting them or wants to learn how to start them. Flowers, there's a lot of ornamental flowers. Those are really funny because I know like with marigolds or zinnias, like when I try to harvest the seeds, I can't even figure out which part of that little fluff is the seed. <laughs> and so I just sort of harvest the whole thing. And, uh, and then I look online, oh, okay, what is a zinnia seed supposed to look like? And then I try to look through the little chaff, all the material, and I'm like, oh, I think there's a seed in there. So those can be issue like challenging to save flower seeds because um, a little bit hard to tell where the seed is. Also, some of those flowers are hybridized for colors. Alyssum is one that's very easy to seed save from, and it's great to bring in beneficial pollinators, surfid flies, really like alyssum. For your fruit trees, for the most part, fruit trees are very heavily pollinated. And so a lot of times, even though the fruit matches the parent, the seed might not. I know a lot of people who have successfully started avocados, peaches, apples, you name it, but that's sort of an outlier. And the challenging thing about fruit trees is it usually takes about five to seven years to find out if it was a seed that matched the parent or not. So you may be growing this amazing avocado tree that never sets fruit. So the other challenge with fruit trees is that they're often grafted onto a disease-resistant rootstock. 
So when you do grow them from seed, they do tend to be more disease susceptible, pathogen susceptible, and maybe are, they'll be doing fine. 10 years down the road, they just die to something that a grafted tree might not. Apples are one that's a little bit easier to grow. I've had some pomegranates pop up in my yard. Some of them never make flowers. Some of them make flowers right away. So fruit trees are kind of hit or miss, and it really depends on um, kind of luck a little bit, or if you did any hand pollinating. Um, I would say if you have a small seed library, fruit trees are something you should probably avoid unless you like an experiment. Fruits and veggies are a great place to seed save from. So, you know, what type of seed you save um, go um, back uh, to what your goals are. You know, are you trying to, in your space, um, you know, get some free seeds that you can offer next season? You know, would you love it if your community gardeners could come to this little box and get the seeds that they want? Are you trying as a community garden to grow a certain type of peas, like a sugar snap pea really, really well? And then maybe you guys all agree to start with a certain variety of sugar snap pea so that they don't crossbreed too much, although they are self-pollinating. And then you can save those. Um, other things to consider, and I just want to jump over to two other presentations. We have this one presentation. This can be found on our gardening channel. And this one is called pollination traffic control. And this is a really important thing if you are growing your own seeds to save at your own seed library. This is something you really need to understand on a basic level. This presentation, we do this every couple years or so, maybe once a year. It's also on our YouTube channel. I'll show you where that is. But understanding this pollination traffic control, understanding will it be true to type? Will it be, um, you know, is this a hybrid plant? There was a question in the chat about an heirloom variety that I mentioned that a lot of people think of as being an old timey variety. Heirloom is sort of like the word organic. It has different meanings depending on how you're using it. But generally heirloom is like an old plant. It's a plant that is open pollinated, but it gets more complicated than that because open pollinated plants can be hybrids. So we don't have time today to go into this, but this is a really important piece of the puzzle if you're growing your own seed at the seed library. And then the other thing is like, this is a presentation that we were gonna do last month on seed saving for your summer fruits and veggies. And this one is all about planning. So planning for your tomatoes, um, kind of breaking it down where the seeds are, how to harvest them, how to clean them, how to store them, and then what do you need to be thinking about to have that seed breed true, meaning that you're going to plant that tomato seed next season, and it's going to give you what you want. And this is where so many people will struggle. So if we go back to this presentation, um, then we'll skip ahead for just a second to the supplies you'll need, and then we'll go back to this topic. I don't know if you guys have any questions. Um, otherwise, I'll keep going and sort of tie it all in together at the end. Um, okay, so I don't see anything. I don't see anything in the chat. Um, somebody said they had a lot of success with their oranges and avocados starting from seeds. Definitely an option, um, but uh, definitely something you either need to be very mindful of how those things are pollinated and make sure they're pollinated correctly. Um, and, uh, or you need to be willing to take a chance and just grow them and wait several years um, to see if they're going to produce fruit. Um, but I didn't see anything else in the chat. So if you are going to start a seed library, super simple, just need a container that's pest free, um, you know, keeps out moths and rodents and stuff like that. Container. Um, oh, okay. So the person um, added in their comment, sorry, good. Okay. They, well, not good. Um, they said that their plants died really easily when they started from seeds. That's typical. You know, I have seed, fruit tree seeds come up and then they'll just die like randomly, like they'll be doing great and then they'll just be dead. And, and definitely that's tied into that, not having that disease resistant rootstock. So yeah, for your container, it doesn't need to be airtight. Again, you're not trying to create a seed bank. A seed bank is climate controlled, 
got the moisture control, the temperature control, that seed is sort of like, you know, cryogenically frozen. It's not, but it's sort of, you know, it's in, it's in a holding pattern, you know, every little seed, like if you think about a pea seed that is just hard as a rock, it's really amazing to think that there's the potential of life in there. And I think it's one of the beautiful things about seeds. I'm not particularly religious in an organized fashion, but very spiritual and um, seeds definitely sort of um, help me sort of marvel at the miracles of life inside this little tiny rock of a thing. There's life in there. Um, but we're not trying to create that. We're not trying to put that life on hold. We're just trying to keep putting on pause um, and uh, not give it the moisture, the soil, everything it needs to sprout. So it doesn't need to be airtight. It should be moisture resistant. And it's important to keep it in a cool, keep it in a cool area. Um, I recommend not storing your seeds in a freezer um, or even a refrigerator. If you imagine when you have a moisture in like a jar or a can in the freezer, as it um, freezes, it expands. And if your seed has any moisture in it, then it can split um, as you store it in a freezer. And the problem with refrigerators is I know my refrigerator has some big changes in moisture. So I just recommend a cool dry place. Um, I keep mine in a Tupperware. My Tupperware is not airtight. Um, there's lots of different versions of what that container can look like. Um, and uh, there was a comment in the chat about using uh, desiccants, you know, like those silica packages. Those work well too. Um, you know, but most seeds will sort of hang in there. The thing that happens with seeds and why you want to store them in a cool, dry place is seeds, um, you know, that first year that you're storing them, they're most likely to sprout and be successful. Every year after that, their sproutability starts to go down. And a lot of that depends on the kind of conditions they're exposed to. They found several seeds that are 800 years old, several thousand years old that they've been able to sprout and regrow. It's kind of exciting and scary at the same time. You never know what sort of pathogens might be in those seeds that they res resurrect. But anyways, um, you know, so stored in the right conditions, a seed can last for centuries. But if they're exposed to moisture, if they're exposed to too much heat, if the genetics are not really strong, then the viability goes down. So, and I don't think I have a note in here, but one of the most important things with seed libraries is you're not growing that, you're not storing these seeds again, like in a bank where they're gonna last forever. You're going to be trying to regrow them every year, every couple of years. So if you have a really important variety that you wanna save, I always bring up this story of my aunt passed away in 1999. I found some poppy seeds from her. I've been saving them like a fool for 20 years. And if they were so important, I should have grown them out each year. And if you have a really important set of seeds, then maybe you grow out half just in case the bugs or the heat takes out that and you have the other half to try to grow next year. So if you are getting into the arena of trying to preserve diversity, we had a, a master gardener who had uh, at a community garden in Rialto and there was a, an abandoned plot, but it was a plot that was managed by this old gentleman or woman who was a longtime gardener. They had these amazing squash. And this squash grew without any watering, without any care. They started saving that seed. They were about five generations or five years into seed saving it. They planted it at a, a, um, a garden in Riverside and the pest took all of the plants and they lost that seed. So as you're saving them, you want to grow them out, but also always save a few on the side just in case if it's an important variety of seed. So the supplies, a container kept in a cool, dry place, envelopes or seed containers. In the seed containers, you can add a silica or a desiccant, something like that. But the idea is not to put those seeds into storage until they're fully dry. A lot of people, when they're storing seeds, you have dry seeds, and dry seeds are the seeds that are dry on the plant. Think beans, think flower seeds, think things like that. Seeds that are wet on the plant are in a, some sort of fruit. Think a berry, think tomatoes, think squash. Those ones that are wet inside the fruit, you want to make sure they're fully dry and they're snappable. They're hard before you store them. And that's, you know, the silica packet won't take enough moisture out to make up for that. So before you do put them in the container, 
And we have presentations on how to do this. And we do presentations throughout the year on how to do this. Um, so that's important. And important to have labeling materials. Labeling and tracking are so important to watch the success of your home save seeds grow and to find out where you're having problems. I've saved seeds where every year I save peas. And every year it made less and less fruit to like the final year I had this big vine and no fruit. I was saving a bad line of peas that probably crossbred with something else and it made it unproductive. Um, so labeling and tracking is important. And then maybe index cards, like thinking about a way to organize them by family, by season, something like that. You also need seeds, right? Seeds, and these could be from the, your own garden at home, at school, at the community garden, or they could be donations. And if you are growing seeds from your own garden, I brought up a lot of challenges you might have. Will they be viable? Viable means will they sprout? You know, were they properly pollinated? Are you gonna get what you're expecting? Was it pollinated by the right plant? Are you trying to crossbreed uh, you know, kale and Brussels sprouts and make kaleettes? Or were you really hoping for Brussels sprouts? Are you trying to crossbreed hot peppers with bell peppers and get a spicy, weird bell pepper? Maybe that's what you're trying to do, but this is one of the challenges, especially in a community garden setting where people might not all be on the same page. Um, you want to know is, um, is it, um, are your gardeners in the community garden, are they concerned about breeding true? Are you going to get support? Do you need to focus on things like lettuce, which are pretty good at breeding true and pretty easy to harvest from? I've had a lot of success with seed saving lettuce at a school garden. Um, easy for the kids to harvest, easy to grow. And um, it's really cool when you have a kid who's in fifth grade growing a seed for their sibling who's in first grade, right? Um, same thing could be done in a community garden. So picking plants that are self-pollinating and easy to seed save from. And we talk about those in our different seed saving education um, classes. Um, and do your gardeners, you know, do they want to invest in this activity and experiment? And do they want to see what they can get? Do you guys all want to agree that this year you're going to seed save peas and everybody grows the same type of peas. Are you all going to grow different peas and you're just going to see what happens? Um, those are some options. But another thing you can do for a seed library to create some of those things we talked about where you're saving some diverse varieties, where you are um, uh, getting a little bit of seed sovereignty or independence for your school, community garden, or yourself. Um, and, you know, not for yourself, you're not probably getting donations, um, but schools and community gardens, there's a lot of companies that will send free seeds to schools and community gardens. And one of the reasons is, you know, it's a goodwill activity, but also seeds on a seed packet, they're required to have a certain percentage of sprouting or germination rate. So if the germination rate is supposed to be 92%, that company has to guarantee that 92% of those seeds will grow. You know, on the one hand, that's good because a company could sell seeds where 5% will grow and they're basically junk. You want to have some accountability. On the other hand, it means that at the end of the season, because they don't know how the seeds were stored, because they don't know what kind of heat they were exposed to, because of different conditions, and different types of plants have different longevity, some better than others, then basically at the end of the season, they need to get rid of those seeds. So we get seeds, um, one of our master gardeners is really great at getting seeds from one of the larger box stores that essentially they would toss out because you know they have seeds packets that are unsold and they can no longer guarantee that 92% or whatever it is will sprout maybe only 70%. So maybe instead of nine out of 10 sprouting, seven out of 10 will sprout. Um, so a question we get a lot is, do seeds go bad? Seeds can go bad and that they won't sprout, but there's no harm in trying to plant them. You're not gonna get a bad plant because something has happened to the seed. Also, most diseases don't get transmitted through seeds. There are a few viruses and a few pathogens that can get through seeds, but for the most part, Seeds are a relatively safe activity at home and not to be concerned about too much um, pathogen um, crossover. So if you're saving seeds, um, you know, bacteria that your plant might have had for the most part aren't transmitted in seeds. Some viruses are, 
um, you know, pests are not transmitted in seeds for the most part, especially if they've been stored for six months in a box. If there was a spider mite sitting on one of those seeds, most likely it's died. Um, cleaning your seeds properly to get the extra seed material off will help re reduce the chance of spreading pathogens. But for the most part, most of the pathogens that might be on your seed, say your bean got moldy, if you're planting that seed in the ground, that mold is a is a mold that's thriving in the air, not underground. And hopefully if you have a nice healthy soil, there will be beneficial microorganisms that will deal with that. So seed saving is a relatively um, safe activity, but if you really want to have just seeds in your community garden at your school, then we can also help you tap into these organizations that will give away free seeds. And we're also through this seed library in every community project will also give you um, free seeds. So schools and community gardens can definitely get donations from organizations in, a different, in addition to ours. Um, and for yourself as a home gardener, I would suggest start looking for non-hybrid varieties of interesting plants. Um, the one advantage to being a home gardening seed saver is that if things don't work out, it's just on you and um, you don't have um, expectations from other people that this squash will grow what it says it is. And so actually with our seed library, we found that we had a really hard time getting people to donate seeds because they were worried about, I wonder if the seed will breed true. Will this squash be as delicious? Will it sprout? Did I do it right? So when you're starting your seed library, you may have some reluctance and may need to rely a little bit more on donations and we can help supply you with seeds. And we also have um, organizations that are very um, happy to send seeds out to schools and community gardens. So I like to have a combination of both. You know, you know, is your seed library for seed sovereignty and saving, you know, great grandma Mary's uh, you know, tomato and squashes that she cooked in her recipes? Then you're gonna want to do growing your own. Are you going to want to be like, you know, every year we want a crop of peas and we want a good crop, then maybe you're having some donated and some um, grown, some grown on your own. And um, I think it's important to um, uh, know that just because you have donated seeds, it doesn't make you any less of a seed library. And a lot of a seed library is just knowing the ins and outs of seed saving and being a resource. You know, if you think about, if you think about probably your great grandparents, um, if I, like I said, I'm in my forties and my great grandparents definitely knew how to start seeds and they knew how to harvest seeds, maybe not from everything, but they knew a little bit about it. And it's up to our generation, you know, if you're 20 or 80, it's up to us to get that information to the public, to be a knowledgeable seed saver. It doesn't necessarily mean We've got to be successful at saving corn or broccoli, which can be really challenging. But just understanding the nuances is, is a step closer to where we are right now, where so much seed knowledge has been lost. Other considerations are at your location. You know, do you have a place to store them where they're cool? You know, is your seed library um, likely to be lost? Do you have a safe place to store it? Will they get wet? You know, just basic logistical things. Um, great to include experienced seed savers or have your community garden, your school garden, whoever engage in continuing education through the Master Gardener program um, in this county and other counties. Um, and it's also important to have someone on a school or community garden level who will take sort of leadership or ownership of the seed library, who will do some tracking of the contents, keep the library clean, keep it stocked um, and answer questions. And for the stocking and questions, that's where the Master Gardener program is really happy to help be that sort of technical assistance to someone who's willing to take leadership or ownership of a small seed library. Otherwise, seed libraries could be run out of a little shoebox pretty much and be really impactful and important and um, be a really important part of the community. Other considerations when you're seed saving at a community level um, is, and, and not so much as the home gardener is, you know, will all your gardeners sort of, you know, is the whole community garden school, uh, are they willing to sort of engage and participate in this, you know, because there's these questions of pollination, cross-pollination. Um, if they're not, again, you want to stick to things that are less likely to cross-pollinate, tomatoes, um, 
uh, peas, uh, lettuce, things like that. You know, you want to find out who wants to participate. Um, you know, we would go back to sort of that seed list and compare the benefits and downfall, like which one do you maybe want to start with for the first year of your seed saving as a community effort. Find out how much experience and how much interest there is in devoting to devoting time to learn about seed saving, or maybe you have some experienced people. And are you just, you know, kind of in this organization for a couple of years? Are you thinking 10 years down the road? And that's one of the challenges with schools and community gardens is there's a lot of turnover over the years of people. And that's where I'd like to think that a master gardener connected to a seed library could create some continuity. So you always wanna think about what you're trying to accomplish. And so just sort of jumping back to your own seed library, you know, are you trying to create community? You know, kind of create a hub of activity of a certain activity in your community garden. For a lot of schools who have a garden, seed saving sort of becomes part of the activity, part of the curricula. They engage it on different levels. And so it becomes integrated into the classroom. In a community garden, maybe it is a way for community garden bed members who might not know each other to work together on a common project. Um, at home, are you creating community with other gardening friends and other people that you know? Um, there's seed saving groups where you can share seeds before the pandemic. We did a few seed swaps and hope to do that again. Um, maybe you're trying to create a little bit of food security. I'd like to think, you know, I'd like us all to do that in a little part. Or maybe you're trying to grow a variety that is adapted like that squash that was so well adapted for that Rialto area, which produced like 25 pound squash and would produce like 50 of them. You could feed an army with those or feed a whole, you know, school with those. And so thinking about your goals, are you trying to preserve old seed lineages? Understanding your goals and defining your goals will help you if you're going to um, sort of create your action plan. And so, you know, if the first thing in your head, you're like, I want a seed library at this location, then maybe if you could think about the things that I shared today and then reach out to the Master Gardener program if you want some support or maybe the items that I gave you today are enough for you to sort of get started. Even if you start your own seed library, never be shy to attend these classes, ask questions, suggest topics for presentations, and if you want to get started with us, where we'll help bring in a container and bring in seeds and provide some specific resources, provide some suggested um, seed saving activities based on your own particular garden and the communities around you, your school, how many people are growing what, and we can definitely help you create an action plan. So I have a, a pretty good list of resources um, that really dives deep into a lot of the logistics of home seed saving. Those are posted um, on our, I'll go back to that in just a second, uh, on that home page. Um, you can find them under recent presentations. Under, um, on our YouTube channel, this is our YouTube channel, you can find a number of seed saving presentations. You can also go to our website and in the upper right hand side, you can click on gardening videos. There's the pollination traffic control, seed saving, um, seed cleaning, a lot of different topics there. And each month we do a seed saving topic. You could sign up for our newsletter, see where we are and what we're up to. And if you have any questions, reach out to the Master Gardener Helpline. Um, so I hope that this was informative to sort of help you decide if a seed library is something you'd like. Um, hopefully it takes a little pressure off thinking that you need to like oh, if we're gonna have a seed library, then we need to grow all these seeds to save. I think that's a part of it. And I think also just sort of creating a collection of um, purchased or donated seeds from the Master Gardener program, or another one is a great place to start a seed library and to start engaging your gardeners if you're at a school or community garden. So if you have any interest in our program, you can reach out to our helpline. You can email me at my email that I put in the chat. And um, what we'll do is we'll sort of, uh, we'll set an initial meeting to talk about your goals. And then if it's at a school or community garden where you wanna do some seed growing and seed cultivating of your own, we can come out and sort of do an assessment and we can donate seeds to you. We can help if you want like a little free seed library or you just want a Tupperware, we can help with that. And then we'll be here to answer your questions. So I think that's it for me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording, and I thank you guys so much for joining today, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to stay on for a few minutes.